UK. I'm going to stop. And um, we can go ahead and get started. We have five lovely panelists. If you guys would like to introduce yourselves, just say who you are and where you work, why you work there. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Shaquan Tanil. I am executive director of Food Chain, a local, uh, a local, sorry, uh, nonprofit here um, in Lexington that focuses on food access and food literacy education. We also were one of the first organizations in the state to have an aquaponics farm, uh, which we um, kind of use as a part of our urban ag education component. So um, I'm super excited to be here and to share. Um, and I joined Food Chain just because I, I'm all about food literacy education. That's kind of a lot of my background and um, learning by doing. Um, so I'm excited to be here. I'm Becky Brooks. I am the president of the Alliance for Women in Media and our foundation. It's a, it's a national uh, organization that is, does connecting education and recognition for women in media, women in television, radio, and digital media. Um, how I got here was a very interesting path. I wanted to be in sports. And fast forward, I worked for a company called Host Communications many, many years ago that was a sports-based company and found a, an association management division and found my passion there. My name's uh, Will Wright. I um, was a student in the UK and now work at a company called Great Stories LLC. And we do um, PR work for nonprofits and private companies. And uh, just got here through, you know, just doing journalism for in Kentucky and elsewhere and um, wanting to try something new. So I started here in October. My name's Sarah Ladd, uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am a reporter, a health reporter at the Kentucky Lantern, which is a new newsroom that just launched uh, late last year. Um, it's part of the state's newsroom uh, national network. And so I've been covering health there since October. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to share. Thanks for having me. And I'm Rufus Friday. I'm the executive director here at the Hope Center. I started here about 18 months ago. I, I prior to coming here, I was in the news media business for about 34 years, and I worked in news organizations in North Carolina, Tennessee, Illinois, Alabama State, and then came here and left to Lexington as publisher of the newspaper here for about seven years before we retired in 2018. And, uh, Join the Hope Center here because of the, the mission that they have as we're on services for those that are homeless, as well as providing job recovery for those that are dealing with substance and drug addiction and also dealing with uh, mental illness here. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for your introductions. Um, I have a general question for all of you guys, and then I have a few individual questions for each of you, just based on my journalism curiosities. Um, but first of all, as this is using communications careers to spark social change, um, one of my questions is just what are your passions and how would you guys define your passions and how are you working to implement some social change because of those passions in your current work? Oh, well, I'm, I'll go first. Um, so one of the, the big passions that I've always had, is, as I said before, is uh, food literacy education and basically leading from the model of meeting people where they are. And I think that Food Chain does a really good job of doing both of those things. Uh, prior to my role as an executive director, I was a 4-H agent for six and a half years. So I worked in Pulaski County, Kentucky. I was the first agent of color in that county. Um, and my primary goal or role in, in that was changing the face of agriculture to particularly to all kids, but especially kids of color, to see that 
agriculture is not cows, sows, and plows. There's so much more to it. And so introducing them through exposure, um, hands-on activities and learning, and basically bringing the lessons to them instead of me expecting them to come to me. And by doing that, I was able to scratch their imagination. And um, I, I love seeing the creativity and I love seeing that that light bulb that kind of lights up in people's eyes when they, they have that first time experience. And to see my students now that I started working with years ago, graduating from college, starting their careers, it just shows that when you put that one little seed of enthusiasm or motivation, it, it can grow into something beautiful. And so that's how I've tried to always lead from in everything that I've done. And um, the other parts of that too is inspiring other people to see themselves in agriculture. It may not always seem like the career for, for most people, but there's a lot of different opportunities that exist in the world of agriculture. And so constantly creating more opportunities and reaching back um, is what definitely helps me to move forward, but also leading by example is another way that, that I've been able to create change in a positive way because agriculture is, especially in Lexington, urban ag, it has become a voice for a lot of community members that technically don't have that voice. And we're teaching them how to, you know, have herb gardens in their window seals and all of these different things. We're giving them that the information that they need to take it and take care of themselves. Well, I'll, I'll chime in there. Oh, Will, go ahead. No, we can stick the same order. You go, Becky. Um, well, you know, my, my career that I'm in now, uh, you know, it's interesting when we talk about passions, as I said, I wanted to work in sports. And so I think, um, my path has allowed me and, and encouraged me to figure out how to do something that you're passionate about on a personal level, but also find new things in a professional capacity, you know, on a personal level, I still love it. Um, in my career path. The biggest thing that I did was allow myself to be open and available to do and try anything. And I would strongly encourage students to do that. Association management or nonprofit management for most people isn't a career path that you think about and in getting involved in this. What it's done for me, and I'm hearing that from you know a few of you, is uh, what I learned is that I'm really passionate about connecting with people, meeting people, connecting people, and getting a group of people to sort of fly in formation to achieve greater things. And that's what I get to do. So when you, you know, ask the question of, you know, well, then how are you using that to impact change and social change right now? I mean, I'm with an organization that's the Alliance for Women in Media. I was sitting at a board table this weekend with someone from Amazon AMP, Hallmark Media, uh, CBS, NBC, you know, very powerful women and the, and the beauty of it is they're just normal like us, right? Like they're just everyday people, but we're using our organization and our uh, power for positive change. And so I think, you know, from a passion standpoint, I just say, try lots of different things because sometimes you don't know what you might become passionate about as you continue in your career. That's certainly been the case for me. I, if someone had told me years ago that I would be the president of an organization that put on an award show in Los Angeles at the Beverly Wilshire, I would have laughed because that's just not my thing. But that's that's what we're doing because that award show is directly impacting show, social change. And so I've learned to love even more connecting people and with really smart people. And, and most importantly for me, I love working with people who are coming up in their career and finding out how to do that. You know, I'm a mom and I'm married and I work full time and, you know, it's a lot, but it's also possible. So I've, I've learned those things that I'm really passionate about by being open to trying new things. Yeah, I like what you said about connecting with people. That's what I think was the first passion that got me into journalism, which just, I like talking with people who are, um, who are interesting and going through interesting points in their lives and um journalism is a great way to like you're right in the heart of all of that and getting to meet a hugely diverse amount of people going through 
um, you know, some good things, some bad things, but all like all very interesting. Um, and so the, the work I'm doing now, it has been, I've been lucky enough to have it line up with my passions for, for, um, for out the outdoors and working with clients who are doing really great work on conservation and advocating for, uh, for rural America and have, have, um, been very lucky in that. So, um, sort of moved into this, you know, PR nonprofit space, and it's allowed me to keep doing stuff that I feel, feel really good about. Well, I will say, um, it's always sounds like a weird thing to say, but I, I really fell in love with reporting um, on health during the pandemic, um, which was when I became a health reporter when I worked at the Courier Journal before moving over to the Lantern. Um, I joined a team with Debbie Yetter, which some of you may know her, and we reported on COVID uh, starting in 2020. And I think for me, I, I mean, I didn't, ever see myself being a health reporter. It just, I didn't really know what sort of beat I wanted. Um, so I just explored a lot of different things. I was on breaking news for a while, but moving over to the health beat, I think I just started seeing like all these tangled webs of misinformation and mistrust. And, and it just, for me, felt like really the heart of what journalism is, which is transparency, getting the truth out, um, answering people's questions, public service announcements, all that. And then Within that, you know, we started seeing this mental health epidemic, pandemic, whatever you want to call it, emerge. And I had always had a passion for, you know, lessening the stigma around talking about mental health. And I think the way reporters can do that is talking about it more and more and reporting on it. And I have definitely seen gaps in in that and not seeing as much coverage of that as I would like. And so where I am now, I mean, I am a health reporter, but in my very long list of topics that I focus on and guide my day-to-day, -day, mental health is number one because I think that's at the heart of so many things. I mean, if you could, if you could see my conspiracy maps, um, all in my notebooks, mental health is right there in the center. So I would say that's a, a really big passion of mine, and um, I want I want to do good by talking about it. And I think that just the more people see um, mental health in the news, the less it's this weird thing to talk about, you know. Um, I'm actually writing a series right now where I take like different um, different things like OCD or uh, borderline personality disorder or depression and just kind of unpack what it really is, what it really looks like and feature somebody who has it and just be like, okay, this is, we can talk about this. It's, it's, not, it's not scary to talk about. So um, that's definitely a passion of mine. And I just, yeah, yeah, I appreciate that question. I'd probably say mine is kind of twofold, but most important, the first thing was exploration and just taking risks. You know, I came from, I grew up in a really small town. Like, you know, 50 plus years ago, it was a really small, sleepy town. And I wanted to get out and, and just explore not only what was outside of my neighborhood, which back in, the, back in my day, that was you know, what it was what you were confined to a neighborhood to see exactly what the world was like. And, and, News media gave me that opportunity to be able to do that. And I think I told you earlier, in almost 11% of the states throughout my entire, my entire career. Never did I ever think that I would end up in a not for profit world about that, you know, that are homeless, dealing you know, with mental, mental illness and substance abuse. But in every single one of the states that I was in and working on the newspaper, we had those. I, of course, Talking about any kind of mental illness issue was, was, was taboo. We were talking about it. Even it was just something that was not shared. But of course, I know a number of years ago when actors and athletes started talking about it, then it became okay to, to discuss that. But you know, we deal with that every day. But I would say for anybody that's listening, you know, there's there's a we live in society now and I'm a big believer in taking risks, specifically at, 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 for the group, for young, just go out there and explore and go into some of the markets that you didn't really think that you would end up because there are places in my newspaper grid I never thought that I would end up in. And I'll tell you, one of them was Montgomery, Alabama. It never got me down in the country of Alabama back during that time because I always thought Alabama was like Mississippi was always burning all the time and I was not going to be a part of it. But it wasn't until I went there and worked at the newspaper down there and I realized that, that my 
perceptions of what the city was all about, what was wrong, and then we got involved in the community, I, I, I had a different uh, opinion uh, as well. So you know, my passion was just in risk taking, and it was a, a big risk to get out of a business that I was in for half my life to come work in a for profit uh, space and to just learn a new career at this late stage of my in my age helping those that are uh, dealing with the drug addiction specifically you know it just seems like just you know, every year there's a new drug that's out there that individuals start rising and become so Sarah, I'd love to get you to come here to talk to our folks that are in a mental illness, that are, that are battling a mental illness to hear some of your experiences. That's wonderful. Thank you guys for talking about your passions and sharing where those came from. Um, another, just one more general question, um, a little bit more specific to what you guys are doing. Um, so when we are working to push social change, we're inherently pushing the status quo. So is there a time when you guys ever had to overcome a difficulty like this when you were pushing this status quo that you remember that really resonated with you and you overcame a difficulty in that aspect? Specific Abby in your I'm sorry, it cut out. What did you say? I'm sorry, I said, uh, can you narrow that down? I'm trying to, I was trying to unpack that question a little bit more. So, are you? Yeah, um, really just so when we are reporting on things like actually, I'm going to change my question if that's okay. Um, so as journalists and just people in media in general, oftentimes we have to be unbiased when we're reporting on things related to social change. So is there a time you remember that you had a moral dilemma or ethical dilemma that you had to work through in order to do your job? I can tell you about a really tough one that I had, and it, it was extremely difficult for me. And this is when I was the publisher out in Washington State. I was publisher of the newspaper that's called the Tri-City Herald in southeastern Washington. And state of Oregon had just passed a law that made assisted suicide legal in the state of Oregon. And of course, Washington State did not have it, but was advocating for, we had a former governor that was advocating for it because he was battling uh, late stage uh, Parkinson's and he wanted the state of Washington to uh, move for assisted suicide uh, law. And I really, really wrestled with it as a publisher at an editorial board at the time, which I was on the editorial board along with six other people. And as an editorial board um, member, I always tried to make sure that I didn't exercise my veto power as the publisher should be able to veto any editorial that we decided to do. So we had a long, passionate discussion about it and it got down to the point to where I, mean, I, I, had, some, I had some moral reasons behind why I didn't think that it was the right thing to, to, to have someone to take their own life versus going through the you know, natural stage. And it was, it, was a, it was a tough one. I, I can tell you that uh, in the end, I, we had to drop it because we just never could come to a, a, a to, to get, instead of a consensus, I really wanted to get to where we had a decision on that, that one. So that was one of the kind of the, the, the dark moments that I had in, in my career as addressing what was at the time seen in Washington State as a kind of a social change type of um, should have been called so the fact that one state had done it, you never seen a lot of people going over the state, state line to deal with some of the what they consider end of life health conditions that they're, that they're a person's operating. 
So do you feel that this was overcome or you said that the solution was kind of to just drop it? How do you feel like that out? Were you satisfied with that outcome? Not really. I was not. I, I guess the thing, the, the thing that we had going for us was that uh, the state of Oregon made it fairly easy, fairly easy for those in Washington to come across the state lines to gain you know, the assistance of uh, suicide uh, decision. But it was a hard one. I mean, we we talked about this a, a lot, and you know, we, we talked about it ethically, morally. You know, should be left up to the individual as far as it comes down to life. It was it was a tough one, and uh, we had a lot of debates on it. And I felt like if decision on this specific, very important topic, we needed to have an unanimous decision. I didn't want to come at it from a standpoint of, you know, I'm the, I'm the emperor, I'm in charge, so we'll just veto it. So just, we, we, could, we talked about it a lot. And in, in the end, we just, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we just couldn't come to a unanimous uh, decision. It was almost like we were looking at it from, from the jury perspective. And that is that if all seven of us can't agree on it, then the best thing for us to do is to, uh, fortunately, right or wrong, we, we punt it on the outcome. Uh, I would jump off of something that Rufus said um, as sort of a learning lesson for me out of two very important um, social social moments that have happened since I've been working with the Alliance for Women in Media. The first was that I was the president of this organization when the Me Too movement began, and we were really at the heat of it. And then secondly was the social justice movement, you know, when really after, you know, George Floyd was murdered and and our journalists were front lines. And those were two really key moments. The, what I would, the learning out of it that I would start with out of what Rufus said is that sometimes our personal opinions can, our personal opinions have weight and they matter. And at the end of the day, what does matter is the organization that you're serving and what voice and lane they should have. And, and sometimes they're not necessarily in conflict but it is critical that while you can have your own personal opinion, what you're doing is serving and leading a nonprofit that has a larger voice than what yours does. And so I was leading the organization when every week there was a man who was accused of some, you know, the Matt Lowers of the world, all of that, that was all happening under my watch. And we had numerous conversations and lots of people who said, as an organization of women in media, you need to be taking a stand. And we said, well, we were founded in 1951. We've been talking about the importance of women in media and us having as many equal opportunities as men for that many years. And by the way, we stand by, there are lots of men in media who actually do support women. So we really took a different shift. We took a, I'm gonna call it a high road. Because what we did is, by the way, during that time is when Hoda and Savannah became the, the first female duo on, the, on any morning show ever. So what we did was we went out and we found all of the people who were doing things in a positive way and we celebrated it. And so we really, instead of trying to create more divisiveness, what we did was try to flip it and find all, you know, women who were being elevated to executive positions. And every single one of those, we took those and said, this is what we are. This is why we exist. Interestingly, then during the social justice movement, we did take a, we did have a statement. And the reason that we did was because we felt like it was really important. We felt like journalists were being attacked for telling stories front lines. And those are our people, if you will. So what we came out and said is that these are the people who are front lines telling stories and they need to be told. Whether you agree with their opinion or sometimes the reporting or not, it's why we have it's why we have an amendment in our constitution to protect it. So there's been a few really key moments, but I think the lesson in all of it is be really clear about the organization that you're serving and we call it our lane. Let's know what our lane is, know the lane that we're driving in and what message it is that we need to send. And we don't always have to have a statement or an opinion on everything. I can have one personally, but it doesn't mean that the organization has to have one. Uh, we, we were also wrestling with that. I, I also serve on the uh, Muhammad Ali Center board, and we were addressing, we were wrestling with uh, the kind of a 
our former executive uh, CEO of the company at the time was wrestling with what kind of position does the Ali Center take uh, in, in Breonna Taylor tapping? And there are a number of people that were in the market that were really upset with the Ali Center for not taking a hard line stance on this. But you had, and you had a CEO that wanted to do something. You had a board that wanted to say, what, what is our role? Uh, what, what's the, should the Ali Center board be a, should the Ali Center be a, a, in a position to either make a strong stand or statement, or should we be a place where we facilitate debate on what's going on? And at the time, there was, there, there was some infighting that was going on within the organization, and there was never a position taken. And subsequently, there was a new uh, CEO, present CEO, that started last year. And she comes at it more from a standpoint of when things like this do happen, the Ali Center needs to, needs to step up and take a stance and have a voice in that. And that the Ali Center uh, did when there was the not, not the, the deliberations that were going on for the uh, for Supreme Court Justice Jackson, the, the, the Ali Center felt like they needed to take a stance and support in the form of a letter that the Senate should confirm her as the you know, first black Supreme Court female justice. justice. So it's gone black back and forth with, with how you know, it was a specific uh, social justice issues are handled, not only in the for-profit space, but non, non for profit space, as well as on the reporting side as well. I'll add one thing. I mean, this is like, I wouldn't, it's not a moral conundrum, but um, just the, in being in reporting where you're going to be driving away from interviews that are hard, you know, and people are going through hell and you're driving away knowing that, you know, no one's going to come to rescue this person. Like the state legislatures are going to do anything. The feds aren't going to do anything, but you write the story anyway. And, um, you know, you do your job, but just, you know, not being a fatalist is an important part of, um, I think, having that mission of social change as a reporter, too. I To kind of go off of what Becky was saying about creating lanes and staying in those, um, one thing that I had to learn as an executive director is I can't be everything to everyone. Um, I have a small but mighty team, and I don't want to stretch them to the brink of insanity um, because the world around us is always going to be in disarray and that is okay. That's why nonprofits exist. That's why everybody in the world has their gifts and talents, but it's not on one particular organization or one person to carry all of that. Um, and so trying to make sure my team feels empowered um, and also to encourage them to take care of themselves because self-care is important. And that was something that I learned even in my previous role as a diversity recruiter for UK during the time when there was social unrest and there was a lot of things that were happening in the world around us, having very candid conversations with my team about what it felt like to be myself, my whole self in the everyday world and what did that mean and how would I communicate that to students um, to get them to campus, but also help them feel safe and build community. And so I took that same experience and kind of infused that at Food Chain to encourage my team to have those uncomfortable conversations and get it all out so that that helps us to make sure that we're staying in line with our mission and also just having those um, checkpoints because those are important. And the more you check in and the more you have that communication piece, the easier it is to get over the hard not so great conversations later down the line. Sarah, did you have anything to add before I move on? Yeah, I mean, I probably don't have much to add except to echo what's been said. I think that I definitely uh, kind of going off what's been said before is just that I really used to think you had to be like 100% objective all the time and that you couldn't have an opinion. And I think um, 
part of the beauty of really good journalism is that you do bring that humanity and feeling. Obviously, your reporting is unbiased, but like you bring your own feelings to the table and that kind of directs how you ask certain things. And so um, I think that was a big learning curve for me is just learning that you you can be human and be a reporter. Um, yeah, that might be the only thing I would add to, to what's been said. Yeah. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Um, so with looking at time, I won't do each individual questions. I'll just email you guys after with my little curiosities, but um, just another general question for you guys, just as a panel, um, just for the students here, what advice would you give to students who want to be and have interest in being engaged in real changes in their career and just getting started with that in wherever they're working? I'll probably say, uh, Abby, to that question, in the, with the advent of the social media space, I know it makes it extremely apprehensive for individuals to step up and step out and talk about their convictions. And I know that, uh, you know, and probably Nigel knows this story. My daughter, when I was in, when I was publisher of the newspaper in Lexington here, she made, she was, there was something that was going on at UK as it pertained to the Blacks being involved in activities there. And she was had was having real good experience as far as her UK experience, but she felt as though the others that were around were not taking advantage of the entities that UK had for Black students. So she wanted to write an editorial. And she wrote an editorial and we published it. And boy, she got some, I'd like to say some spirited feedback as a result of it, and uh, you know the, the pressures of getting that critical feedback, it was pretty pretty tough on her. But I, I know in this new social media space, when you have a conviction about something, you, you have to be able to, as I say, you know, handle the heat that's going to come as a result of it. I I used to have when I was in the when I was in publishing business, I, I'd have a saying that was typed to my phone because I dealt with so many phone calls and emails. And that saying was, you know, never fear criticism when you're right and never ignore it when you're wrong. And that was kind of the principle that, that really guided me and helped me as it, as it pertained to being a newspaper publisher and being able to handle that criticism, extreme criticism, even though you know you're right. But then also being mindful of the fact that when you get it wrong or, you know, it comes off and it's not the way it's supposed to be, it's not balanced, or if it's got a little bit of subjectivity in it and you get the criticism from, from it, you gotta, be, you gotta be willing to handle that. But I know in, in this in social media space today that we're, that we're in, there's some younger uh, generation folks, they get really sensitive when it comes down to getting critical feedback and then they wanna crawl up into a shell and not express their convictions that they do have. So, you know, I encourage them, you, know, you gotta be bold and you gotta be able to, to, to handle the, the criticism specifically and know that you're right, stick to, you, stick to your conviction. Yes, I would wholeheartedly support all that, that Mr. Friday just said, because um, working with people is hard. Um, working for people is hard. Um, anytime you work in any kind of social aspect of a career, you have to be willing to um, stand strong in, in your beliefs uh, and understand that not everybody thinks the same way that you do. And understand that there's a there's a there's a two way street in, in the the beauty of working with people. There are going to be some people that are going to be on the same page as you. There are some that won't. But there is a way for differences to still be in the same space and work harmoniously and make things happen without there being major conflict. Now, conflict is inevitable, but there is a way to make it work. And just keeping that in mind, but but as Mr. Friday said, if you if you feel strongly about it and you know that you're right, that that's really the key to it. And don't allow anyone to make your thoughts or your beliefs, don't allow anyone to make those falter. If you've done the research and you know in your in your heart that that's that's what you believe, then let it be so. Um, that would be my my greatest advice that I, I feel like I've ever gotten in my my life is that working with people, you're going to have some people that are just going to give you trouble and that's OK. 
But as long as you believe in yourself and you believe in the mission of your organization and what you what you want to do, just keep on it. It's not going to be easy, but the results at the end is that that great big pat on the back that you need to say, okay, I may have gone through high water, heat, and some other things, but I made it and I have something to show for it. And and also be open to collaboration because many hands make light work. And so working with your your neighbor, your friends, even people that you may not always get along with, you all can work together to make things happen and create something great for your community. I would just like to echo that because I always think of this, um, I think Mr. Friday was talking about, you know, outwardly expressing, um, you know, the opinions and I think internally too, inside newsrooms or organizations or whatever it is. Um, I have this memory that I'll never forget, which is at my first job, um, a boss had made a comment that I think was like clearly, you know, inappropriate, like it was a joke or something, but it wasn't an inappropriate joke. And um, a female coworker turned and said, I don't think that's appropriate and here's why. And I was just blown away that she not only recognized the problem, but spoke up internally. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, an outward big deal, but she like addressed it. And everyone who heard the joke also heard the unpacking of how it was wrong. And so um, I always feel like speaking up, you know, to bosses or to, you know, people at the top of a ladder who are losing perspective on things like this, um, you know, can help transform a workspace really. And I think that it's, it's never a small thing to speak up when you see inequities or injustices around you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just agree with that too. Just that being a good coworker is such an important part of like, you know, being an effective, whatever you're going to do, reporter or anything else in, in the workspace. It's like taking your coworkers out to, you know, to coffee or just hanging out, listening to them about their concerns um, is, is so important. And it will help you um, by not viewing them as competition. It will help you in the long run. They'll boost you up, you know, and um, I know there's been a lot of like unionization efforts happening. Um, that stuff happens from the ground level, from those like those little interactions too, and can really help um, make difference in, in workplace. Yeah, I just, I jotted down just a couple of quick things. And I would say that one of the things that, um, you know, I can be a pretty, pretty passionate person. You have to be whenever you're in, in positions of leadership. But I would say that um, I will just use the word. I think one of the most important things is learning to listen. Sometimes you, sometimes we forget that we have two ears and one mouth um, and all of us are passionate about something. And so we have to respect other people's passions. So I think listening and respect is really critical. I, I used the word earlier. I don't love the divisiveness of the world that we live in. And I know that I can't change it singly. If I were to talk about something that I'm passionate about, it's getting back to when we realize that we can live and work with people whose views are not exactly the same, but we have to respect each other. And so part of that comes from listening. And I totally agree with Will. Like sometimes when you humanize a person, it allows you to be able to hear why they think that way. And it's okay if it's completely different. I have a best friend from college. We could not be any more polar opposite in some of our views on things. And in good news, on a personal level, it's great because our personal relationship doesn't have anything to do with that. So I would just say that it's really important to learn that you can work with people and you will work with people that number one, you may not like a whole lot, but you can learn to respect each other. You also need to learn to work with people. I'm, I'm, what's your came to, we, we have a small but mighty team. I need to have people on the team who think, this is a, I feel very strongly about this diversity of thought, obviously diversity of color, but people who don't think like I do have to be on my team or else we can't get our work done. And that makes things really hard sometimes. So be passionate about something and speak your truth and be willing to hear the other person to whom you might be speaking. And save up enough money so that you can walk away. Yes, agreed, Jackie. <laughs> um, so there is no other side to Hitler. And I don't have to write it. 
Yes. Um, well, before we have about 15 more minutes before I open it up to questions from students and other people here and have like an open conversation. Is there anything that I didn't ask that you guys want to mention or feel like is relevant? One thing I would add is, um, and we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but I really want to strongly encourage if you haven't done internships um, on a, like every summer, if you haven't been doing that, please start. Um, I had an internship every single summer from my freshman year all the way through my graduate school experience. And it led the trajectory of my life. It showed me that I do not want to work in a field. I do not want to step in snake holes. I do not want to be sunburned. All of those things I wouldn't have learned had I not had an internship every single summer. It teaches you what you like, what you don't like, because I would hate for you to start a career, work for three months and realize that you don't, that's not for you. That's a waste of your time and your resources and your energy. That's what internships are for. So if you haven't been doing that, I would encourage you to start. You can even start doing it in, in the fall and spring. You don't even have to wait till summer. But the point is, it's about exposure. It's about experience. And honestly, it's the difference between you getting a job when you graduate and not. Because when you don't have internship experience, it is extremely hard to break into an actual career when you don't have anything to show for four years in college um, to say, you know, this is the amount of experience I've gained in my four years. So I would encourage you to do that because it does make a huge, huge difference. And it helps you build a network of people that will support you and write letters of recommendation for you too. If people hire just on GPA and on internships, I would be unemployed. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> awesome. Well, does anyone else have anything else before I move on? The only thing I would I couple with that is um, I, I wrote down earlier when you were talking about questions, you know, sort of mantras that we've lived by. And when I was growing up, my dad, literally the word the phrase was always hard work prevails. If you're willing to work super hard and give it your all, most of the time you're going to be willing to work. So I love what she just said about internships. And by the way, be willing to do anything, be the person who's willing to try and support and do anything on that team, because you may find something that you had no idea that you would love. But working hard with a good attitude, as Will talked about that earlier, working with your coworkers. Right now, I can tell you in the working in the working space, that will go a really long way. So be willing to go anywhere. I mean, I think that Will Will Wright can speak to being out in Eastern Kentucky to New York City, now down in Charlotte, North Carolina. Be willing to go anywhere for that opportunity. My, one of my first mentors in the business told me about going see myself there and he said look you're not going to buy a burial plot there so just go there and work as hard as you can and you'll be able to name your spot the next uh, time don't so we waited to the fact that i'm not going to end up in this particular place because you think absolutely you never know what's going to happen you're not going to buy a burial plot is always going there Absolutely. Well, thank you guys. Um, I'd love to hear from students or advisors if you guys have anything to add to the conversation, questions, comments. I do have a question. Um, so when when it comes to like the careers that you're in now, if you was to have like a conversation with your younger self, what would you tell your younger self? Like, is there anything you would do differently or do you guys feel like you landed exactly where you wanted to be? Like, what, what would that conversation be like talking to your younger self? I would tell you myself, <laughs> I'm definitely gonna need math. <laughs> I think a lot of people, you know, make that assumption that, oh, you're going into media, you don't need math, but, um, at least in health, like there's a lot of trend work and data that goes into it. And um, I use math a lot, so. Don't tell me that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh yes, you will use math. I, it's, it, oh my gosh. 
I had no idea, especially coming into an executive director position. I have an undergraduate degree in ag econ and a master's degree. And I have done more math in this year and two months I've been on my job than I thought that I would. I'm like, geez, I, I mean, I know how to do it and I haven't used it since grad school, but I mean, creating formulas and Excel spreadsheets and having to create budgets and breaking budgets down and percentages. Oh my gosh, all the math, all the math. And on top of that, the reporting that I have to do for my grants, very math intensive, very. Um, but if I were to tell myself anything, my younger self, I would tell myself that fear is not Fear is not the, the guide of my journey. Be fearless. You can do it. Fear, it, it, it. fear is nothing. Fear is nothing. If I could tell my younger self anything. Um, because fear, like Mr. Friday was saying about not having, um, being complacent and, and only wanting to go in certain places, me being fearless has allowed me to do much more because I, I left a lot of my comfort zone. Um, and I didn't allow fear to do that, but it took a long time to get to this space to be fearless. So my younger self, I would say, be fearless. Fear is not the determinant of my, my journey. Kaki mentioned this earlier, but it's such a small thing, but like save, try to save some money. Like, you know, a lot of these entry-level jobs are out of college. Unfortunately, they should, but they don't pay that well. Um, and it's, you know, um, even just a little bit a month, just for when I, when you want to make that next jump to that next job, um, having some extra cash makes a huge difference with being able to move and just being mobile. Um, so definitely I would tell myself to be a little more, a little more smart with the money. Yeah, I'd probably say my younger, what I would told my younger self in my first job in newsprint reading was like Will said, save some money because it was the first, the, the earlier years were hard and it was, I should have, instead of blowing through money, I should have been saving a few dollars here and there because the first few years when I got into the newsprint business, business side, it was hard. I guess if I'm in this new role that I'm in at the Hope Center here, I would tell my younger self, don't get connected or hooked see firsthand the power of what addiction can do and he deal with a lot of 18 19 20 years. started this in high school and now they are dealing with some of these some of the most uh, deadly drugs known that is just it's very depressing so I would tell my young to definitely don't steer away from being kind of drug. Um, I have lots of things I would tell my younger self. <laughs> um, having fun in my 20s was worth every minute. You know, I was working really hard, traveling a lot, and yet do it. Um, I, I kind of echo, unfortunately, about the math, but I would say, um, similar to Will, I really, really hated accounting, like really, really hated it. And I, um, like she was the, I mean, the amount of time, but in good news, it's all very practical numbers now and you care about it, right? And you're in this job, you're like, oh, now it makes sense to me. I don't need a debit and a credit. I don't want to have to worry about the debit and credit, but as long as you can be functional and competent enough to do but that is real, the budgets and the numbers and all of those things. Um, the other thing I would say is, uh, you know, it's probably not great advice, but make it till you make it. You know, just sometimes you're put in a position that someone believes or you believe you're like, I think I can figure this out, that somebody thinks I can do it. And, and so I live a lot by a mantra of fake it till you make it. And I, I used to keep my posted, Mr. Friday was talking about his, this is when I, at one point in my career, I was in events and, and producing really major events, which I am now, but in a different role. And I literally kept a post-it note on my computer and it said, it's a posture, it's an attitude. If you're not common confident, no one else will be. And it was 
I lived by it because people would look at you to see what your demeanor is and how you're approaching a situation. And if you're panicked or if you're, and so sometimes the fake it till you make it was no one is going to see on the outside how panic I am right now. And under, we call it the swan, you know, a swan on the top of the water moves like this and underneath is paddling like crazy. And, you know, as you said, your small but mighty team, we're doing that every day. So that would be my, my younger self is it's okay. Somebody believes in you, you believe in yourself and you know, you can get there, but fake it till you make it. Is that everyone? I think that's everyone. Um, well, I wanted to reiterate how thankful I am for all of you guys joining today. And seriously, I would love to stay in touch with every one of you and students and people joining. If you would fill out the link in the chat for attendance, we'd really appreciate that. And I have like three more minutes if anyone else has anything they want to add.